Hi class, we're going to continue on with our history of the atom notes today, and it'll be part three of those discussions. Quick review of what we ended up with our last one from part two. We talked about Rutherford, and Rutherford had done a very, very important experiment that kind of opened our eyes a bit that there was more to an atom than we thought. And what did he do? If you kind of see in the middle of the screen here, he had this piece of gold foil. And he had these alpha particles, and that's what these lines are, these arrows are, that are meant to be going across their page. And he, he bombarded these alpha particles into the gold foil, he kind of launched these alpha particles into the gold foil, shot them at the gold foil. And our understanding of the day, our expectation was that the alpha particles would go right through this gold foil. Right? And that's what we see over here. Most of these arrows are going straight through. But he found out that a very, very small number sometimes would bounce back at him. And that's what I'm trying to show here with this button, with one of these arrows here. It actually bounced back at him. Very surprising. And so what did Rutherford conclude from this? And the, he came up with the idea that the atom must have a positively charged nucleus because it was able to scatter our positively charged alpha particles. And that that nucleus must be very dense and very massive. So here was the idea that I mentioned about thinking of a bowling ball and bowling pins, right? If you roll a bowling ball down through the down at the bowling pins, it's going to hit the bowling pins, and it's going to pretty much go straight through. Right? If you roll it with any speed at all, it's just going to go. It's going to go pretty much straight through. Um, but then, if we if we think about that, because the bowling ball is so massive compared to the bowling pins, but if we roll a ping pong ball, it's not very massive compared to the bowling pins. What's going to happen? There's no way that that ping pong ball, if it hits one of those bowling pins, it's not gonna, it's not gonna push that bowling pin over. The, bowling, the ping pong ball is actually gonna bounce right back at you, and that's how Rutherford interpreted what was going on with the scattering that he saw. Now, because the vast majority of the alpha particles went through, that helped him also understand that most of our atom is empty space. We have these very dense, positively charged nuclei. Um, positive of nucleus, or a, a, a plural of nucleus, but they're very scattered. They're not close to each other. There's a lot of empty space between them. Which then brings us up to the first person we're going to talk about today. That's Niels Bohr. And what did Niels Bohr do? This is about the time when we were making great strides in physics and chemistry. And we started thinking, learning that energies of our electrons were, uh, they were in different orbits. We started thinking about them as orbiting around our nucleus, kind of like planets orbit around the sun. In our picture of the atom now, we have this massive, dense nucleus with electrons orbiting around it, just like we have this massive, dense sun at the center of our solar system, and the planets all orbit around it. And we understood from uh, classical physics at the time that the farther out you are, right, so the, if, you're real, if you're in close, and you have a low energy, and the farther out you go, you have a higher energy. And so we thought that same idea would happen with the atom, right? The farther from the nucleus the electron would be, the higher energy that it would have, the more energy that it would have. But we soon found out there were some problems to this, and we'll talk about this in tomorrow's lecture. Uh, but the prediction from Bohr's model would be that the electrons are in a specific place, that we can actually say, okay, Boom, right here, there's an electron, and it's at that spot at this point in time. Right? Here's this electron. It's in that spot at this point in time. We started learning that it wasn't quite right. The other thing that we saw with Bohr's model of the atom is that we could predict where the orbits are. Right? Predict where the orbits are. And, and that also, we found out, wasn't quite the way the atom was working. Now, this Bohr's model took us a huge jump in our understanding and explains a lot of things, but I just want to kind of give you a hint that we're going to talk about a little bit more complexity here uh, tomorrow. Now, to finish up our discussion about pieces of the atom, it was uh, 1932, so only 88 years ago. Right? This is not that long ago. You've got, you might have grandparents that were uh, grandparents or great-grandparents that were born then uh, prior to this time. The neutron was discovered. And what's important about the neutron, right? We've already learned the neutron. It has the same mass of a proton, same mass of a proton. And that's why when we look at our periodic table, we can see the, the atomic number, the number of protons that we have above our 
symbol is different than the atomic mass, the number at the bottom of our symbol. And that's because neutrons are involved. And neutrons have a similar mass to a proton, so they are going to have, they're really going to impact the mass of our atom. But they don't have a charge. And that's why they were, took us so much longer to detect those because we couldn't see them by their charge. So by 1932, we had all three of our particles, our electrons for a negative charge, our protons for a positive charge, and our neutrons. And we understood that we had a nucleus and that it was mostly empty space. So we kind of got all the pieces. Now we're going to study a little bit more about how these pieces are interacting. And that's where I'm going to bounce back to Bohr's model. So about this time, the scientists were doing flame tests. And what's a flame test? Some of you have already done this, and hopefully COVID will allow us to do uh, this experiment with the rest of you. But we could put different chemicals in flames, and that would be a way for us to change where our electron is, put it into a different state. So let's explain a little bit more what I mean by a different state. So an electron, we're going to say, can be in a ground state or an excited state. And I want you to think of the ground state as being the lowest energy for that electron. So kind of think of uh, if we're outside, if we drop something from the first row of bleachers or the, or the top row of bleachers in our football stadium, the ground state, that's when something's at the ground. It can't go any closer. To, it can't go any further down to the lowest energy that it can be, right? So when we think about this, we're also going to say, well, when our electrons at the lowest energy it can be, it's as close to the nucleus as it can get. Right? Close to the nucleus as it can get. That means it's in its lowest energy state. Now when we have uh, multiple electrons orbiting our, uh, our atom, our, our nucleus, then they're going to be in different orbits because right, we can't put all two, we can only put two, for example, in this lowest circle, this lowest orbit, because there's only two spots. And we'll learn more about that when we, uh, in the future here shortly, too. And if we had to have another electron in here, it's going to go up to the next orbit. Right, so they're, they kind of fill the room. So the first, the first orbit only has two rooms, only two electrons can be handled. If we had a third electron, it can't go down to that lowest level because there's no room for it. So it's going to go to the next level up, like I showed here. And we can kind of fill in. Right, so we're going to put another electron in that second level. Right, we add another electron, then what's going to happen? Whoop, then it'll go into a higher level yet. So what do I want to talk about here? So this is our ground state. The electrons are all as close to the nucleus as possible. They're all in as, in, as far into the ring, smallest rings that they can get. So an excited state. What do I want to call an excited state? If we add energy to an electron in that ground state, right, we, we hit it with a photon or a beam of light, or we heat it up in a, in a flame, we can kick that electron up a level, up a level. So it's kind of like thinking of uh, going up the stairs at the at the football stadium, right? You can go up a stair, you can go up a stair, you can go up a stair. Um, you can keep going to higher levels. And of course, we understand the higher up you are, the more energy you are. Think about it. We can jump off of uh, uh, two steps and we don't hurt ourselves. But if we jump out of two stories, we're probably going to hurt ourselves if we're that higher up or that much higher energy and our bodies can't take it when we hit the ground with that kind of high energy. So as our song here kind of hints, the electrons are going to jump up to a higher energy level. So I want you to watch the electrons here as... Uh, as I'm going through, and you're going to take that low one of the inside electrons. I'm going to, we're going to give it a kick, and it's going to bounce up. It's going to jump up to a higher energy level, to a ring farther, an orbit farther from the nucleus. And we can keep doing that, right? We we punch, we jump the next one up. It's going to go up a level. Now I hope you want to see that uh, the first electron it jumped up two levels. The second electron here, I I uh, caused it to jump only one level. So they, they have to land at a certain level, but they can jump one, two, three, four. It can be any number of levels. just depends on how strong we we, uh, we hit it, how strong of a jump we give it. Right? And we can take this other electron here. We can keep uh, causing our electrons to jump up to higher energy levels. Now, if you notice a picture of the atom here, the electrons are not as close to the nucleus as they can get. Nobody's in that inner ring. Nobody's in this. Uh, and there's only one electron in the center, second ring. So these energies are this atom would be called excited. Like the electrons are not in their lowest possible energy state. I just kind of wrap this up. When an electron goes from the ground state 
to a higher state, it's got more energy. And we see that electron gains energy, right? Either from uh, heat and a flame or from a, a light uh, photon hitting it and kicking it up a level. Uh, we call that going, they're jumping up the higher energy orbits. We call that the excited state. So around this time, they were doing flame tests, right? We, we did some of that with some of you. Hopefully we'll do that rest where we would heat up something and our photons, our heat rather, are going to kick our electrons up. They're going to cause them to jump up a level. But at some point, those electrons are going to fall back down. Right? We're used to things, they fall back down. And when they fall back down to their original orbit, they're losing energy. So what happens to that energy? We know energy is conserved. Well, that energy gets changed in and it gets released as a photon of light. Because we know light is a form of energy. Right? So here's a little picture of our eye. When I'm talking about a photon, Right, we're talking about photon being a packet of light or a little, for lack of a better description, a light particle. And our eyes can see those. Our eyes can see certain one of the certain kinds of those to be more specific. Right? But we need our eyes. Our eyes can detect these photons. Now, when we see photons, the photons can have different energies. We're just talking about that here. We have electrons can be different energy states. So when they fall back down, they're going to release uh, light particles or photons of different energies. And what, why is that significant? Because our eyes can detect those different energies and we see them as different colors, different colors, right? So depending on how far the electron falls, tells us how much energy it's gonna really change into a photon. The energy of that photon tells us the color that we're going to see. Now, some colors we can't see, there's too much energy. Some colors we can't, uh, or we can't see them because they have too little energy. We can see just a little slice of these, and our eyes are attuned to see uh, photons that are the same energy that mainly come off of our sun. Kind of we've adjusted to our environment. But we do see different colors because of the different energies. Now, Bohr's model could predict these colors because right, it understood the idea of energy levels, but it only worked well for hydrogen. It sort of worked for the other atoms, but nowhere near as good as for hydrogen. Well, why did it work so well for hydrogen? Because hydrogen is the simplest atom we can have, just a single proton and a single electron. There's not, we're not even talking neutrons here. One proton and one electron. Very, very simple system. So Bohr's model, being a simple model, worked really well for those. And part of the reason, we, uh, as we learn more, we looked at more, higher, uh, more complicated atoms, and we saw Bohr's model broke down. And that's when we started adding in more complexity because we learned more. And our models get more complex as we learn more. So Bohr's model worked well for hydrogen because it was a simple model for a simple atom. More complex atoms going to require a more complex model. Right, so when we see light, of course, we see the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. We're used to with our rainbow. And those colors, different colors, have different energies. Different energies. Okay, the Different colors of light are due to different amounts of energy. Very, very important uh, observation here. Red has our lowest energy. Think about that infrared. Uh, we can think about that as as, uh, as heat. Right? Uh, you use uh, heat goggles or night vision goggles. They're looking at infrared. They're looking at low energies. You think about it at nighttime. It's dark. It's not. It's, it cools off at night. There's lowest energy. And the other end of our spectrum, our, our violet, uh, has the highest energy. So you can think of ultraviolet beyond violet. Um, What's, what's that? If we get sunburned, it's the ultraviolet light that's burning us. It has more energy, and it's able to burn us. So that helps to think of it that way. Uh, ultraviolet, and we think about that, we put on sunscreen, right? We're blocking out the ultraviolet rays. Ultraviolet has the highest energy. The violet has the highest energy, and it's, that's why it's able to burn us. Infrared does not. Okay. So when we started looking at some of these things, we can look at the emission spectrum of different atoms and we're going to look at the emission spectrum of a hydrogen here and what do i mean by emission spectrum um i mean if we if we take a look at uh the light that comes off of an atom when we heat it up right what's the different light that'll come up and we see all in our flame lab we put the chemicals in there we saw different colors of light come off uh, but we can measure very specifically which colors of light are coming off because we can detect the energy of those uh light particles and what it looks like to us is kind of like a barcode. Just think of a barcode on a package. We're going to see a bunch of different lines, right? And every bar on this barcode is, is where we have an electron that's released a photon. So every bar is caused by a photon. 
And that photon is caused by an electron when it falls from an atomic excited state back to a ground state. And because we have different, many different orbits, right? We have many different places that the atom can, that the electron can fall back to. It can be in the fourth orbit and fall back to the third orbit. That would give us a certain energy. If we fall, if it's at the fourth orbit and falls back to the second orbit, that's going to be farther down. It's going to release more energy, so it's going to have a higher, more of a blue color or a violet color, right? It's going to go that way. It's going to more to the violet side. And it could release, it could go, maybe it goes from the fourth level down to the first level. That releases so much energy, we can't even see it. It's ultraviolet, right? But the point here is that every one of these bars is a specific amount of energy, and that's going to tell us a specific jump that an electron's making from what level to another level. And here's an example of what a hydrogen spectrum looks like. Right, so we've got, it's kind of flipped around when I was showing you before, but here we have our a low energy uh, jump, fall of the electron. The jump, electron didn't jump very high, so when it falls back down, it releases a low energy kind of reddish uh, kind of photon. We get a little bit more energy, kicked it up a little bit farther, so it's able to jump, fall down farther. It has more energy that it loses, and, and we can keep on going, right? And finally see that it's getting more from the red up to the purple. And, of course, it go, we can go off either end of this because our eyes don't only see this middle portion. But it's real obvious that we have certain energy levels, and that helps us understand that uh, Bohr's model was helping us understand why we saw those different levels. All right, guys. That's it for today. Uh, please... Check out today's uh, lecture video uh, questions, and we will see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye.